Welcome to our Fall Women in Public Policy Program Research Seminar Series. I'm Anisha Cindy. I'm a WAP Research Fellow. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar with the work we do at WAP, we equip leaders and change makers with rigor rigorous evidence-based strategies to advance women and gender equity. Um, before we start, we wanted to offer a virtual land acknowledgement to honor local indigenous communities on the land where Harvard University sits which is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary unceded homeland of the Massachusetts people, the surviving descendants of the first people of Massachusetts, and of the Neponset Band of the Massachusetts. The WAP team have posted the link to our land acknowledgement in the chat, and we encourage you all to explore the resources in addition to reading the statement. Um, our seminar this, year, this fall is exploring how gender researchers, policymakers, and practitioners can commit to strengthening the focus on intersectional research. We will explore how gender intersects with other social identities such as race, class, national origin, disability, parental status, and sexual orientation. Our intersectional focus will not only address the unique experiences of people with these intersecting identities, but also engage with the systemic biases and oppressions which characterize these experiences. Many of the researchers that we are featuring in our seminar series today are also featured on our gender action portal. So I encourage you all to explore GAP's intersectional work at gap.hks.harvard.edu. I also want to note that our seminar this week is co-sponsored with um, Harvard's Women in Tech Plus Allies Affinity Group, which I also have the privilege of co-chairing. Uh, WIT Plus aims to develop an IT community at Harvard that is committed to increasing representation, retention, and advancement of marginalized genders on campus. Um, today, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. India Johnson, uh, presenting an ally you say supporting Black women in STEM settings via allyship cues. Dr. Johnson is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Butler University and the founder and principal consultant at Evolve Diversity Consulting Services. Broadly speaking, Dr. Johnson's research examines interventions to support marginalized people in organizational environments, and her work has been published in many top peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, Psychology of Women Quarterly, and Group Processes and Intergroup Relations. She's been awarded multiple grants for her work, including grant funding from the NSF, the National Science Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, and the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology. A few logistics before I turn it over to Dr. Johnson. Um, she will be presenting for around 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers from our virtual audience. We ask that you hold your questions until the end of the talk, and those who have the those who have a question will have the opportunity to be unmuted and ask your question out loud. Um, and I will be managing the Q and A portion of the seminar, so feel free to send me questions in the chat as well if that um, is easier for you. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much. Um, I am so excited to be here in this virtual Zoom space with you all. Um, anything could, could be commanding your attention these days. So I really appreciate the fact that you're willing to tune in to my little corner of the universe and allow me the opportunity to talk about my work. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, thank you to Laura and Anisha uh, for organizing and the opportunity as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we all know by now that when you're in the Zoom space, if you don't say, I'm gonna share my screen first, uh, that it doesn't work, right? Like it only works if we first share our screen. So can everybody see that? Okay. Yeah, that looks great. Unmuted. Yes, okay, good. All right. So let me kind of get my bearings here. All righty. So I'm going to uh, talk about 40 to 45 minutes today, and I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of jump into uh, uh, my presentation. And so whenever I am presenting my work, I always like to start and end by kind of grounding uh, my work in the people who, who make this work possible. Um, and so I, of course, want to begin by acknowledging my, my awesome and amazing collaborator on this work, Dr. Ivava Pietri, or Eva, as I call her. Uh, we do a lot of work together. She's a co-author on the, the two studies that I'm going to be sharing with you all today. Um, we're also really good friends, so I, I love that I'm able to investigate these questions with someone that I met in grad school and became really good friends with. 
Um, I also want to acknowledge my uh, the students in my lab. I actually call the students in my lab my labbies, my lab babies. Um, and so I am at a predominantly undergraduate institution. I love mentoring. I am the product of amazing mentoring. Um, and so these students pour into me and we're able to talk about these questions. And so they also contribute to this work indirectly. So I just wanted to kind of begin by acknowledging them as well. Okay. So to give you kind of an overview of, of how today's talk is going to go, I'm really interested in, in this particular question. So kind of exploring if exposure to an allyship cue, and I'll talk more about what an allyship cue is later in the context of today's talk. If this can be used as a strategy to help Black women feel a sense of trust and belonging in STEM environments. And so I'm going to spend about the first half of my talk kind of unpacking um, the background that kind of led to being interested in this particular question. And then, of course, I'm going to share my two experiments with you all that are part of this paper in which we try to address this question. And then, of course, we'll have some time at the end for questions. Okay. So probably as no surprise to this group, we know that Black women have been historically excluded from a number of lucrative and powerful positions. Okay? Um, so for example, we know that there's this gross underrepresentation of Black women in leadership roles. So in 2019, there was an actual record number of women who were CEOs of Fortune 500 co companies. A whopping 6.6% uh, was a record number of women in these kind of very powerful positions. However, when we look at these 33 women, we see that black women are grossly un underrepresented in these numbers, okay? And so in addition to kind of seeing this underrepresentation in these leadership roles, we also know that black women have been historically excluded from science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM for short. So black women make up about six and a half percent of the United States population. However, when we look at the numbers in STEM fields and STEM careers, they only represent about 2% of STEM jobs, okay? I also wanna note that uh, this is not due to a lack of interest. So sometimes when I talk about this work, um, persons who are not familiar kind of with the background will infer that that underrepresentation is because black women are not interested in these careers. We actually know from work comparing black women to their white female counterparts, for example, that they have equivalent interests in these STEM jobs Instead, what seems to be happening is the experiences or the challenges that they're facing in these actual STEM environments. And so this kind of begs that question, why the lack of representation? And so as I, as I mentioned, we know that Black women are facing some very unique obstacles in these environments. Um, so for example, there are a number of experimental studies that have kind of examined how the gatekeepers in these settings, the persons who are deciding who gets that postdoc, uh, who is awarded that fellowship, who's going to be the lab manager in my lab, for example, um, they tend to have biases that favor white men. So even when you have applicants who have equivalent qualifications, um, these gatekeepers tend to favor white men and perceive them as more uh, competent relative to, to black women, for example. Okay? So in addition to these biases, we also know that when we focus on the experiences of black women in these white male dominated environments, that the environments themselves tend to be unwelcoming. And so uh, black women report feeling as though they have to be to work harder in order to be perceived as confident as their white female counterparts, report feeling isolated and not just having a lot of support in these actual environments. And so these biases kind of coupled with um, these unwelcoming, sometimes even very hostile environments can manifest as Black women experiencing belonging concerns and really questioning their fit in STEM to begin with. And kind of this prolonged sense of belonging con uh, concerns can manifest as Black women exiting STEM classes or STEM majors or the STEM workforce altogether. Now, this idea that Black women are experiencing belonging concerns is what we in social psychology call social identity threat, okay? Now, social identity threat is just feeling as though one or more of your identities is not valued in a particular setting. And we know that social identity threat is this very multifaceted construct. It's actually associated with a number of negative downstream consequences. I'm going to be focusing on two in the context of today's talk. And so when persons are experiencing social identity threat, this can manifest as a decreased sense of trust, or a decreased sense of feeling as though you can uh, be treated fairly by your colleagues. 
And it also can manifest as a decreased sense of belonging. So feeling as though you're not um, very welcome or going to be supported in this particular environment. And so we know that among the negative consequences, de a decreased sense of trust and a decreased sense of belonging are associated with social identity threat. Now, we also know from past work that individuals who have multiple marginalized identities like black women are at an increased risk of experiencing social identity threats. So they're particularly vulnerable to kind of experiencing these belonging concerns. Um, so for example, this is one of the people in my life that brings me joy. This is my daughter, Lyric. This is actually a picture of her um, when she was starting um, high school as a freshman, she's now a senior. Um, Lyric is black and she is also female. And we know that there are negative stereotypes associated with being black. There are negative stereotypes associated with being a woman. And so kind of these compounding um, experiences can put persons like Lyric at an increased risk for experiencing social identity threat, which means that they're less likely to have that sense of belonging in STEM settings. Now, importantly, we know that belonging is this really critical uh, predictor for these outcomes that we care about. So specifically, women who feel an increased sense of belonging in STEM classes, for example, are more likely Hello. to report interest in the actual major, and they're also more likely to persist and go on and enter STEM fields. So if we want to increase the representation of Black women in STEM fields and STEM careers, it's really critical that we identify interventions that are going to boost that sense of belonging. Okay. So one particular strategy to kind of promote a sense of identity safety or promote that sense of belonging is through exposure to an identity safety cue um, or a signal that suggests that your identity is valued here, okay? Now, identity safety cues can come in a variety of different formats. The ones that I'm going to be focusing on in my talk are exposure to a successful in-group exemplar. So someone who kind of represents you potentially being successful in that environment. And we know that exposure to identity safety cues can kind of promote that sense of identity safety or promote that sense of belonging in these STEM environments. So for example, past work has um, looked at the benefits of exposing women. And so this is just kind of defining women broadly of all racial and ethnic identities to a successful in-group scientist. And we know from this past work that when you expose women to a successful in-group exemplar or a scientist, that this boosts their sense of belonging particularly in STEM environments. So this is one strategy that you can use to kind of mitigate those social identity threat concerns, okay? Now, when it comes to black women, this kind of poses a problem for uh, past work on identity safety cues and in-group scientists, because much of this work has ignored the intersectional nature of identity. And so thus, when it comes to black women, it's unclear who that in-group scientist is going to be or who is going to be that person that promotes that sense of belonging or identity safety. Is it going to be an individual that shares a common racial identity? Um, is it going to be someone who shares a common gender identity? Or is it critical for both identities to be present? This is a question that actually hadn't been addressed in previous work. And so it's unclear who's going to signal identity safety for black women. And so when my collaborators and I were interested in answering this question, we focused on research that kind of acknowledged the intersectional nature of identity to kind of point us in the right direction of who's going to signal identity safety. And we kind of narrowed in on two different perspectives. And so the first is, is what is called a primary identity viewpoint. And so this primary identity viewpoint is largely based on what's called the ethnic prominence perspective. And the ethnic prominence perspective argues that due to the historic and also the very much ongoing and continuing nature of racism in the United States, um, when it comes to persons who have these multiply marginalized identities like black women, their racial identity is going to be the primary lens through which they view the world. And there's actually support for this model. Um, and so for example, um, they found that black women are more likely to um, attribute experience of experiences of discrimination or explain kind of like why you're experiencing that discrimination as a result of their racial identity more so than as a result of their gender identity. And so applying the primary identity viewpoint to my work uh, would suggest that when it comes to answering this question of who is going to signal identity safety, who is going to be that successful identity, uh, identity safety cue, 
it's going to be an individual who shares that common racial identity. Um, so black women and black male scientists would be a more effective identity safety cue than a white woman scientist, okay? So in contrast to the primary identity viewpoint, there's also um, what's called a compound identity viewpoint. And so this perspective is informed by a number of theories that kind of highlight that double jeopardy or that compounded experience of having these multiple marginalized identities. And so a compound identity viewpoint argues that the experiences of Black women are unique due to those kind of compounding challenges from both their race and their gender. And so the role model or the individual that would be most effective for kind of signaling identity safety would be an individual who also faces those compounding unique challenges. Um, so a Black woman scientist. And that Black woman scientist would be more effective at signaling identity safety than a Black man or a white woman or a person who only shares one of those marginalized identities, okay? And so we kind of have these two competing predictions about who is going to signal identity safety. And my collaborators and I thought that there might be a critical moderator or a variable that's kind of predicting um, who is going to be that effective identity safety cue. And we thought that that critical moderator was going to be stigma consciousness, okay? So stigma consciousness is really relevant to um, the two studies that I'm going to be sharing with you all today. So I'm going to just kind of slow down just a little bit to kind of unpack it. And one of the things that I always tell my audiences or my students is that social psychology, for the most part, tries really hard to name things what they are. So, and that's because it helps us understand it. And so when you're thinking about stigma consciousness, this is a, a, a construct that really captures how aware someone is of their stigmatized identity. So think of it as like stigma conscientiousness. And because of that stigmatized or that marginalized identity, a person then anticipates that they're going to experience discrimination. And so we recognize that Black women may vary in the extent to which they are anticipating discrimination because of their racial and their gender identity, or that they may vary in stigma consciousness. And where they fall in terms of their stigma consciousness might then dictate who is going to signal identity safety and who is going to act as that effective identity safety cue. And we thought that this would be the case for uh, a few different reasons. So first, we know from past work that the higher a person tends to be in stigma consciousness, um, the lower they tend to report a sense of identity safety or belonging in, in a variety of different environments. Um, likewise, we know that persons who are higher in stigma consciousness tend to be more vigilant. They're paying attention to cues in their environment that suggest that they will experience some type of social identity threat. Finally, we also know um, from work that has, that's kind of pitting the experiences of multiply marginalized persons against those who are singly marginalized, that multiply marginalized individuals tend to report that they anticipate that they're gonna be mistreated because of their identity at a greater rate than those who are singly marginalized. And so taken together, this kind of suggests that stigma consciousness would act as this critical moderator of who is going to signal identity safety for black women, okay? And so we actually explored uh, this specific question in some earlier work. And so we set out to kind of understand who's signaling identity safety for Black women and how stigma consciousness fits into that equation. And interestingly, we found evidence for uh, both perspectives, both the primary identity viewpoint and the compound identity viewpoint. So specifically, we saw that among Black women with low to average levels of stigma consciousness, that they reported a greater sense of belonging in STEM environments when they learned about a black woman scientist or a black man scientist. So an individual that shared they com their common racial identity. And so among black women who had low to average levels of stigma consciousness, we found evidence for a primary identity viewpoint. In contrast, among black women who had higher levels of stigma consciousness, they only reported a sense of identity safety in STEM environments when they were exposed to a black woman scientist. So someone who shared both their racial and their gender identity. And this is in support of that compound identity viewpoint. And so we answered this question of who signals identity safety. And we also saw that stigma consciousness was this critical moderator, meaning it depends on participants levels of stigma consciousness. Importantly, 
across uh, a few different studies, we consistently saw that a white woman scientist, a person who only shared a common gender identity with black women, that they failed to signal identity safety for black women. And so uh, this question kind of, or the fact that we found the absence of uh, this white woman scientist signaling identity safety kind of brings us to the present work. And so since uh, I consistently saw in my work that a white woman scientist did not act as an effective identity safety cue for black women, we thought perhaps if we paired a white woman scientist with an allyship cue, or an explicit signal that suggests that white woman scientist is an ally, that this might then help that white woman scientist function as an effective identity safety cue across varying levels of stigma consciousness, okay? And so this is going to be kind of the focus of the two studies that I'm going to be sharing with you all. And so we focus on allyship um, largely because past work has found um, kind of this positive relation between um, perceiving an individual as an allyship and identity safety. Um, so for example, we know that the more um, black women who are STEM majors perceive white individuals as allies, the more they then report a greater sense of identity safety um, in their actual STEM classrooms. And so this kind of suggested that allyship could be this beneficial pathway to kind of promoting a sense of identity safety among black women. And so when it came to kind of identifying what allyship looks like and how we could signal allyship, we focused on a number of past studies. And what these past studies um, kind of highlighted is that um, effective allyship kind of has two important ingredients. And the first is that um, white individuals need to acknowledge the challenges um, that racial and ethnic, ethnic minorities face because of, of, of racism, okay? So acknowledging those challenges. And then the second piece is taking some type of action to combat that actual challenge. And so in the context of today's study, we're gonna be focusing on an allyship cue. So focusing on how a white woman scientist can signal that she is an ally. And we kind of operationalize it in this way, right? So having both this acknowledgement and this action component. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be examining the efficacy of two specific allyship cues. And so, as I mentioned, um, our allyship cues, they both have both of these important ingredients, right? So acknowledging the challenges that Black women face in STEM, but also taking some action to combat those challenges. Um, but we kind of introduce these cues in two slightly different ways. So in our first condition, um, we had a white woman scientist uh, that basically expresses or describes herself as an ally. And so we call this our self-identified ally condition. So it's not the case um, um, in the manipulation that the white woman scientist said like, I'm an ally. So she didn't explicitly label herself as an ally, but she described herself in a way that's consistent with allyship. And so she acknowledges the challenges that black women face. And then she also describes some of the actions that she takes in order to um, kind of combat those challenges. And so this was our self-identified ally, allyship cue. The second allyship cue that we explored um, is what we call an endorsed ally allyship cue. And so this cue is very similar to the self-identified allyship cue. However, kind of a critical difference here is that rather than the white woman scientist kind of describing herself as an ally, this information is coming from another black woman. So here you have a fellow in-group member who is endorsing that white woman scientist as an ally, as an individual you can trust, someone who seeks to support black women in STEM. And so whenever I, I talk about this particular study, I always give um, the analogy of uh, the election that feels like it was so, so long ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, but you all likely remember that Beyonce, a black woman, came forward and endorsed Hillary Clinton as uh, the candidate for the presidential election, right? And so here we have a black woman who is saying, yes, I'm with her, you can trust this individual, and that this might be particularly important for other black women in terms of kind of trying to identify a white individual that they can trust. Okay. So the other piece that I kind of want to emphasize is that we recognize that there's a difference between someone kind of expressing that they're an ally, so kind of self-espousing allyship, versus someone who is an in-group member saying this person is an ally. And because we were exploring this question across varying levels of stigma consciousness, we recognize that for Black women who are higher in stigma consciousness, that the fact that an in-group member is endorsing that person as an ally is likely going to be very critical. And so we actually were predicting that our endorsed allyship cue would be more effective 
than our self-identified allyship cue, okay? And so now that I kind of laid out the predictions, let me go ahead and jump into the two experiments. And so we recruited black women from the general population using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, just in case you're not familiar with Amazon's Mechanical Turk, it is just an online uh, data acquisition platform um, that helps you recruit specific uh, populations. So in this instance, black women, and they do so for a fee. Okay? I also wanna note that these are black women for the general population broadly. So these aren't black women who are specifically in STEM settings. Uh, when we compare um, uh, black women who are in STEM settings to black women who are kind of in non-STEM settings, we tend to get very consistent results. And so we just looked at black women broadly. And so they viewed this webpage for a fictitious STEM company and they were just asked to imagine how they would feel if they were working in this company. And so this is our fictitious STEM environment. So we then ran, randomly assigned our black women participants to one of four conditions, just meaning that they're each gonna get something different across condition. And so in our first uh, two conditions, they just learned about a successful employee, a successful scientist that is working in this company. And so that person was either a black woman or a white woman, okay? Importantly, the information in the profiles um, is the same across condition. We just varied the photos. So of course, the black woman, they're gonna get the photo of the black woman. And then the white woman, they're gonna get the photo of the white woman. Um, and then we were good researchers and we made sure that we pilot tested these photos in a separate study to make sure they were matched on things like perceived competence and perceived age and likability, okay? Then we had our two allyship cue conditions. So in our self-identified ally allyship condition, um, they're gonna learn about that white woman scientist. They're gonna see everything that is in that white woman profile condition, but then they're gonna read an additional slide um, where Dr. Melissa Evans describes kind of her approach to her research and what has helped her be successful at the company. And so what she says in, um, is kind of this manipulation where she's describing herself as an ally. And so she says that even though I'm a woman, I recognize my experiences as a white woman are very different than that of black and Latina women. And because I value their perspectives, I work really hard to make sure that I recruit them into my lab, but also into my research group overall. And so here she's acknowledging the challenges that they face. And then she's also engaging in some action to kind of combat those challenges. Okay. Then we have our endorsed ally condition. And so this condition is slightly different. So here our participants are going to read all of the information that is in the uh, self-identified allyship condition, but then they're gonna read this additional slide that I have featured on the screen here. And so in this endorsed allyship condition, um, they learn about a research assistant, a black woman who is working in the scientist lab. And she describes her positive experiences with the scientist. And importantly, she kind of expresses and describes this person as someone who she perceives as an ally. And so here we kind of have that endorsement coming from someone who is part of, of our black women's our black women participants in group. Okay. So these are our four conditions. Uh, what did we measure in this first study? Um, so we measured perceived allyship. And so we just had participants complete two items that got at the, ex, uh, the extent to which they perceived that scientist they learned about as someone who was invested in the success of black women succeeding in the sciences. And then to measure um, identity safety, we had participants complete 12 items that just got at um, the extent to which they felt a sense of trust. So feeling as though you'll be treated for, uh, fairly by your colleagues, for example, and a sense of belonging. So feeling as though you'll be welcome and supported in this particular environment. And this was our way of kind of getting at identity safety, okay? And then finally, um, because we know that Sigma consciousness is this critical moderator, we also had participants complete a measure of Sigma consciousness, okay? And so this was a nine item measure that really just got at the extent to which they anticipated that they would experience discrimination kind of broadly in their day-to-day -day life because of their race and gender. So importantly, we modified all of the items to kind of get at the extent to which they anticipated discrimination on the basis of both their, excuse me, their racial and their gender identity, okay? So um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my results and I'm just gonna orient you to this graph really quickly because you're gonna see it a couple of times throughout um, today's talk. So we have perceived allyship on the Y axis. On the X axis, we have Sigma consciousness and Sigma consciousness is actually increasing as we're moving from left to right. And then we have our four conditions and what we did is we dummy coded our conditions and we're gonna use our white woman um, condition as um, our reference group. So kind of think of it as our baseline. And then what I always tell people 
is pay attention to kind of what's happening in each condition. So pay attention to that slope of the line because it's kind of telling us what's happening as stigma consciousness is increasing, okay? And so we ran um, this regression analysis um, uh, looking at uh, condition, mean center stigma consciousness, and then of course the interaction of the two. And so uh, first, just kind of looking at the white woman scientist condition, you see that as stigma consciousness is increasing, perceptions that that white woman scientist is an ally is decreasing, okay? Conversely, when you look at that black woman scientist condition, you see that as stigma consciousness is increasing, perceptions that that black woman is invested in the success of black women is increasing. What about our two allyship conditions? So in our self-identified allyship condition, you kind of see that negative downward slope. So as stigma consciousness is increasing, perceptions that that self-identified ally actually is an ally is decreasing. And then for that endorsed ally, we see that upward slope, okay? And so we did actually see a significant interaction emerging. And so we of course want to break this interaction down as a function of participants who are low in stigma consciousness versus participants who are high in stigma consciousness, because we know that this is a critical moderator from previous work. And so first looking at participants who are lower in stigma consciousness, and we do see a significant effect of condition relative to that white woman scientist condition. And so here, what we're seeing is that relative to that white woman scientist condition, our three remaining conditions, so that black woman scientist, and then our white woman scientist paired with those allyship cues tends to be more effective than that white woman scientist in the absence of any allyship cue. Similarly, when we look at the, um, the effective condition among participants who are high in stigma consciousness, we again see that significant effect of, of those three conditions relative to that white woman scientist condition where having a black woman scientist or having a white woman scientist pair with an allyship cue is more effective than no white woman scientist, uh, or excuse me, no allyship cue being paired with that white woman scientist. But of course, we wanna pit our two uh, allyship cue conditions against one another, okay? And so when you compare that self-identified ally to that endorsed ally, we again see a significant interaction with stigma consciousness emerging. However, here what we're finding is that among black women who are high in stigma consciousness, it's really critical that they actually are exposed to that endorsed ally. And in fact, we ran an additional analysis where we compared our uh, endorsed ally to our black woman scientist condition. And among black women, sci among black women high in stigma consciousness, we didn't see a difference emerging for that perceived allyship. And so here, this kind of suggests that that endorsed allyship cue is really critical, okay? So what about our second measure, our measure of identity safety or predicted trust and belonging? And so this analysis was ran consistent with that for that perceived allyship. So here first, again, looking at that white woman scientist condition, we again see that really steep slope where stigma consciousness is increasing, per, um, perceptions of trust and belonging and the STEM environment are decreasing. For that black woman scientist, it's actually relatively flat, right? So regardless of whether participants are high or low in stigma consciousness, they tend to be reporting um, um, kind of um, equivalent levels of trust and belonging in the black woman scientist condition. Um, what about that self-identified ally? Here we're seeing that downward slope. And then for that endorsed ally, again, we kind of see a pattern that is consistent with that black woman scientist, okay? So here we see a significant interaction emerging as well. So we of course want to break this down as a function of participants who are low versus high in stigma consciousness. So among participants who are low in stigma consciousness, we're actually not seeing uh, that big of a difference. Um, but among participants who are higher in stigma consciousness, we are seeing that significant effect of condition. Um, so relative to that white woman scientist condition, that black woman scientist, or our two um, allyship cue conditions are more effective at kind of producing um, anticipated trust and belonging than that white woman scientist. But again, we wanna pit our two allyship cue conditions against one another. And so when we do that, we find that that endorsed allyship cue is more effective than that self-identified allyship cue. And we again found that that endorsed allyship cue did not significantly differ from our black woman scientist condition among black women who are high in stigma consciousness, okay? So I've thrown a lot at you with these two studies. Um, so let me just kind of summarize uh, really quickly. And so what we found is that among Black women with higher levels of stigma consciousness, um, foremost, being exposed to any allyship cue was more effective than um, a, a white woman scientist without an allyship cue. So we overall saw that, saw that there was just this benefit of being exposed to those allyship cues. 
However, when we kind of compared our self-identified ally to our endorsed ally, we actually saw that that endorsed allyship cue was most effective among Black women high in sigma consciousness. And in fact, our additional analyses found that that endorsed allyship cue did not significantly differ from that Black woman scientist condition in terms of perceptions of allyship and anticipated trust and belonging among Black women who are high in sigma consciousness. And so what this study kind of suggests is that that endorsed allyship cue is critical or is really um, important in order to kind of promote that sense of trust and belonging among Black women who are higher in sigma consciousness. Okay. So one kind of uh, drawback of, of this first study is that that endorsement from that Black woman actually came from a Black woman who was working in the company because she was a research assistant of, of the scientists. And so in my second study, I want to again explore the efficacy of that endorsed allyship cue, but I want that endorsement to come from a Black woman who's not associated with the company to kind of um, identify the unique effects of endorsement. And so that's what we're going to do in this second study. And so in study two, we again recruited Black women from the general population using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, just in case you're curious, um, Amturk has this um, important feature where it allows you to exclude past participants from a new study. And so this is a brand new group of Black women participating in this study. And we use the same setup as study one. They're just going to imagine how they would feel if they were working at this company. So this is our fictitious STEM environment. And then in the second study, we only had two conditions. Okay? So because we saw that an endorsed allyship, um, ally, or excuse me, that endorsed ally, allyship cue, which is a mouthful to say, uh, was most effective, we're going to focus on that cue. And we're just going to pit that against a white woman scientist that doesn't have an allyship cue paired against it. So in the second study, everyone is going to be reading about a white woman scientist. And so our white woman scientist condition was consistent with that that I described for study one. And our endorsed allyship cue condition, um, it's slightly different from study one. Um, so specifically what we did here is first, uh, we're gonna have that black woman who's endorsing our scientists as an ally. Um, she's gonna be someone who works outside of the company. And so it was actually uh, someone who was described as a community partner, a local high school principal who's worked with Dr. Melissa Evans um, in order to kind of make sure that uh, black students and just uh, black women are being recruited in system. And so that was kind of our first variation. So the endorsement is coming from someone outside the company. A second variation is that rather than have our participants um, first read about the scientists describing themselves as an ally, all of that information actually came from our black woman scientists. And so we did this because it allowed us to kind of examine the unique effects of endorsement. And so here, they're not gonna read anything um, that the white woman scientist is saying that describes herself as an ally. Rather, that information is gonna come exclusively from that black woman scientist. And so consistent with study one, um, this information has those critical ingredients, acknowledgement and action. And so um, the black woman scientist describes the fact that this white woman scientist acknowledges the challenges that black women face in STEM settings, and then works with her to kind of make sure that um, black women and black students are being exposed to the sciences and to STEM as well, okay? And so these were our two conditions in study two. And so what did we measure in this third study? Uh, so we measured uh, what our measurements were consistent with that of study one. So specifically, participants are going to um, respond to those same two items to get at perceived allyship. They're again going to have our 12 items that assess predicted trust and belonging. And this is going to serve as our measure of identity safety. And then because we know that sigma consciousness is this critical moderator, participants are going to respond um, to those same nine, nine items to get at the extent to which they anticipate discrimination on the basis of their race and their gender. So getting to our results. Ooh. Okay, Let me click a little, there we go. So getting to our results. So this analysis is ran consistent with that of study one. So we have perceived allyship on the y-axis um, and sigma consciousness on the x-axis and sigma consciousness is increasing as we move from left to right. The main difference here is that um, we're again gonna have our white woman scientists serve as our reference groups that baseline condition. And then we're just going to regress um, our mean center sigma consciousness condition onto perceived allyship and as well as the interaction of the two. So kind of uh, first looking at the slope of the line in that white woman scientist condition, um, we see that this is consistent with that of study one. And so as sigma consciousness is increasing, participants are reporting um, lower levels of uh, perceived allyship. 
However, in our endorsed allyship condition, oh, my pointer doesn't want to work, it's okay. Uh, we see that uh, this condition seems to be effectively kind of promoting that sense of perceived allyship. And so we do see that significant interaction emerging. And so we want to break this down as a function of high versus low levels of sigma consciousness. So among participants who are low in sigma consciousness, we are seeing that significant effect of condition. So relative to that white woman scientist condition, that endorsed allyship condition is promoting perceptions of allyship. We see a similar pattern emerging for participants who are high in sigma consciousness. However, here you just see that it's more exaggerated, meaning like the difference between the white woman scientist and the endorsed allyship condition is much greater, okay? So what about anticipated trust and belonging? Um, we see a pattern of results that's very similar to that of uh, perceived allyship. And so here participants, um, we're again seeing that significant interaction. And so we wanna make sure we break this down among participants who are low versus high in sigma consciousness. And so we see that significant effective condition emerging among participants who are low in sigma consciousness, where they're reporting greater trust and belonging um, relative to that white woman scientist condition that doesn't have that allyship cue. And again, we see a similar pattern emerging among participants who are higher in sigma consciousness. But again, the difference between the white woman scientists and the endorsed allyship cue condition is more exaggerated, okay? So to summarize uh, the second study, we saw that among black women who were high in sigma consciousness, um, they're reporting the lowest levels of trust and belonging unless they were exposed to that white woman scientist paired with an allyship cue. And so kind of taking both study in one and two together, um, it highlights that it's really critical, particularly among Black women who are high in sigma consciousness, um, to be exposed to that endorsed allyship cue, or to kind of pair that white woman scientist with an allyship cue, so that person can act as an effective identity safety cue, and kind of promote a sense of trust and belonging among Black women in these STEM settings, okay? So I very quickly want to talk about uh, my future directions before we kind of open up the floor to questions. And so one of the things that I always make sure that um, I highlight when I talk about this work is that I'm also very much interested in authentic allyship. Um, so one of the criticisms of this work is, is that what if you have persons who just kind of go around trying to get people to endorse them as an ally, can that potentially uh, result in some kind of harm? And I would say, absolutely, you're absolutely correct. And so I think of both identity safety cues and allyship cues as a contract, right? So it signals that this is someone that you can trust, but you have a responsibility to do the work to make sure that you're making good on what you're signaling. And so because of that, um, my colleagues and I are really interested in authentic allyship or transformative allyship. So the type of allyship that is really geared towards transforming systems of inequity. Um, and so we're, unpacking that work right now, I can talk a little bit more about kind of what we found. Um, a lot of it is based on kind of um, highlighting the difference between acknowledging and action and how that can fit into allyship overall, okay? So in addition to kind of focusing on authentic allyship, I'm also um, interested in kind of using what we've learned from this work to kind of inform some type of intervention, particularly in STEM classrooms, um, to kind of teach uh, white STEM instructors how to act as allies so we can make sure that we plug that hole in that pipeline and that we have more Black women seeking out these STEM classes. And so right now that work is focused specifically on anti-racism. Again, I'm happy to talk about it if anyone has any questions. And then finally, um, I'm also interested in interventions that support other historically excluded groups in STEM. And so I shared um, these studies that focus on Black women, but we have some other work that focuses on Latino women um, and also uh, white women as well. Okay. So finally, I want to uh, thank the persons who give me money, right? So uh, this work is near and dear to my heart. So folks who are willing to open up their pocketbooks and pour money into this work, um, I'm very thankful for that. So thank you to my funders. And then as I mentioned, I like to ground my talks in acknowledging the people who helped make that work possible. I started with my collaborators in my lab and I wanna end by thanking um, my family. Um, so I am a mom in addition to being a, a professor and a wife as well. And I'm only able to do this work because I have people who pour into me and bring me joy. So I'd like to acknowledge my family as well, particularly my husband, Ricky, who allows me to explore these questions um, unencumbered. Okay. So thanks again um, I, uh, for this opportunity. I would love to hear whatever questions you all might have, uh, but thanks so much to Anisha and Laura for inviting me to share my work today. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. This was amazing. Um, <laughs>
I think, yeah, great. <laughs> Um, so I want to open it up for questions. If folks have a question, please go to the uh, reactions tab and use the raise hand function. Um, and I will call on you to unmute yourselves, or you can also put your questions in the chat if that's easier. All right, I see Anne has a question. I'll ask to unmute you now. Thank you very much for the video as well. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, I was it, it reminded me of some interventions that firms, you know, sometimes use. So when they use like anti-discrimination messages for hiring, and there's research in economics that shows that these types of messages don't work. One of the reasons why they don't work is precisely because the, the message is not credible. So I think the the uh, part of the issues that are related to to also what you're showing is how scalable are these results? Because if you if you have too many people who single themselves as allies, maybe then the, that signal is not going to be credible. So I, I I don't know if you have any kind of uh, um, research that goes a little bit in that direction. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, thank you, thank you. That is a, a great question. And yes, you are absolutely right. So there's a lot of work on um, identity safety cues broadly, and then also uh, my work on allyship cues. And it's exactly what you describe, Anne. So people will kind of see these cues, but if there's a mismatch because, uh, between kind of what you value versus what you do, then that can wind up doing some kind of harm. And so there is some work that kind of looks at those kinds of things. Um, so there's some, some work that focuses on what they call diversity dishonesty. So where you kind of have these cues that express a commitment to um, diversity or anti-racism, for example. But then when I look and see who's working in your company or I look to see um, what kind of policies you have in place in your company, um, it doesn't seem to support what you, you claim to value. And, and so we do know that those kinds of things can kind of um, harm uh, that sense of identity safety. Um, in terms of my work, you know, I talked about um, these initial studies um, focusing on the acknowledgement versus the action. And we do have some studies with um, actually black women students um, where we try to parse those things apart. And then we also have some studies with um, white women in STEM majors where we try to parse those things apart. And as you can imagine, the, the part of that equation that is most critical is action, right? So um, I would probably even say that if you are acting in a way that uh, combats those challenges, that that in itself is expressing how you, you actually feel or acknowledging those kinds of challenges. And so um, across both of those data sets, we do see that black women um, and white women who are higher in stigma consciousness tend to be more sensitive to kind of noticing the difference between the acknowledgement and the actions. Um, but I think that from an organizational standpoint, it's really critical that your actions, um, I think speak louder than your words, right? So what are the policies that you have in place in your company um, that speak to gender inequity or speak to racial inequity? Um, have you examined how um, tech companies, for example, tend to have a lot of defaults that support um, kind of white norms or masculine norms or just heteronormative norms in general, do the, does that then interfere with the success of marginalized persons in the particular company? And so the more you can make sure that the policies, the procedures, and also the people who are in your company kind of support that message, I think the more likely then you will see kind of, um, kind of promoting that sense of identity safety and perceptions of allyship. So that was a, a long answer, but hopefully I, I answered your question. Perfect. Thank you so much, India. Um, we have a question from the chat from Sarah Wald. Um, I recognize your study didn't cover this, but what is your perspective on whether the allyship cues would also be as effective with a white male scientist? In other words, does the white female scientist gender carry some of the weight of implied allyship or is it neutral and negative without the cues? That is a great question. So um, I, we do have some data that kind of examines that. And so in general, in the absence of an allyship cue, um, a white woman scientist is not effective, but neither is a white man scientist. Um, part of why we focus on um, white women scientists, and I didn't mention this in the talk, is because in some areas of STEM, um, gender parity has been achieved. So when you look at areas like biology or um, chemistry, for example, um, there's a fair number of, of white women there who could potentially act as these effective identity safety cues. 
Um, so part of what uh, we've done since this paper was published was kind of try to examine if pairing an allyship cue um, with a white man scientist, if that can be effective. And it can, um, so it kind of operates in the, in the same way that um, the cue works in being paired with a white woman scientist. Um, so in general, kind of what our work has found is that in the absence of a common racial identity, white individuals, regardless of whether they are a man or a woman, um, do not tend to be effective identity safety cues. But if we uh, pair that white woman or that white man scientist with an allyship cue, um, that that then helps them kind of promote that sense of identity safety among Black women. Perfect. Thank you so much, India, and thank you, Sarah, for that question. Um, I see Eliza has her hand raised, so you can probably unmute yourself, Eliza, but I'll ask to unmute you anyway. Thank you. Um, this was amazing. Thank you so much. I feel like I learned so much from this presentation. Um, and I wouldn't say I have a direct question, but I would love to hear more about the authentic allyship and especially the allyship uh, intervention training, because I had the same thought to your point of, um, you know, endorsing someone and how that could potentially get, you know, muddled and maybe not endorsing the correct people. So I'd love to just hear more about your research with that. Yeah, uh, so thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate those uh, positive and kind words. Yeah, um, so I kind of mentioned that we're not just interested in authentic allyship, but transformative allyship. And so I think when you think about um, allyship and what allyship looks like, I think one of the challenges of not just social psych work, but work outside of social psych is kind of trying to figure out what those concrete behaviors look like. Um, I do a, a, a bit of consulting and oftentimes when I work with organizations, um, they it's very much just tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do. Like they want just like a list of, of concrete behaviors. And, and what we're finding in our work is that it's not necessarily the specific behaviors because you can imagine that um, context and, and, and what works in one organization might not work in another, but it's more so about behaviors that are geared towards um, undermining um, the inequity overall, right? So if, um, if you think about this from the context of, of racism, for example, right? Do those allyship behaviors kind of promote, um, or do they promote, are they focused more so on dismantling um, systemic racism? Are they more so focused on um, just kind of making yourself look good, right? So you can almost think about this in terms of, um, is the person more so internally motivated, right? So I recognize that um, there's, racism in the world. I want to engage in behaviors that are going to kind of undermine that racism. I want to participate in dismantling white supremacy um, versus I want, I want to make myself look good, right? Or I want to make, or I want to feel good, right? So this might make me feel better to do this kind of thing. And so they tend to be more long-term behaviors. So we've looked at these in the context of um, STEM classrooms. So thinking about like when you teach assignments, you know, using strategies that are, have been shown to be more effective with marginalized students some more problem-based um, learning or um, even just acknowledging the fact that there is systemic racism in, in different areas of STEM, um, what other behaviors? So even thinking about what types of things you assign to students, right? So when you assign students um, readings or chapters, do you focus on white heteronormative um, and male examples, or is it more so kind of trying to make sure that they are exposed to lots of different types of exemplars? So I, we kind of think of these behaviors as, as more high effort, but behaviors that tend to communicate your values. Um, and so one of the things that I always tell people about allyship is that um, it's a verb, it's about what you do, and it's, it's about what you do every day, right? Because um, patriarchy and white supremacy takes no days off. And so we have to make sure that we show up every day to engage in actions to kind of dismantle that. And so it's really about the combination of, of those behaviors over time that kind of seem to signal a person is an ally and also promoting that sense of belonging. Um, and so right now, the other part of your question was about um, the training intervention. Right now, we're trying to collect lots of different kinds of data with lots of different types of populations and to use that to kind of develop like a workshop that's focused on what are the ways that professors who are invested in these kinds of questions can kind of change how they approach teaching um, to try to make sure that they're signaling that they're there to support um, uh, Black students. Okay, so again, a long answer because I'm long-winded, but hopefully that, that kind of helped and answered your question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Perfect. So I, I do have one question and it is a little bit of a selfish question as someone who helped run an employee resource group here at Harvard. But have you seen any effectiveness in within employee resources groups or framing allyship as collective action? I think people view it very much as like individual like learning journeys and like you were saying with the trainings. Um, but something we've talked about at Harvard WIT is we used to have an allyship group that was a male allyship group that was a group of men sitting in a room talking about how they can be better allies to women. And we realized that is not, maybe not the best way to, to frame allyship. So I wonder if, whether it's through your consulting work or, or through your future directions, have you seen any effectiveness in the ways in which employee resource groups can help spur allyship in organizations? Yeah, so that that is a, a good question. And I, I have a few different thoughts about that. So I think one, um, it's really important for any organization to have explicit norms in place that um, highlight that everybody has a responsibility to contribute to um, dismantling inequity, right? And so you talked about kind of that collective action piece. Um, I think that the more we can um, make it so that people recognize that this is an important norm, the more people are gonna strive towards that goal, okay? And I say that because um, sometimes when I talk about this work, people will say, well, what about the people who just don't, don't care about this, right? Like what, what about the people who, who don't wanna be allies? Um, and I 100% get that in the real world, there is always going to be someone who's unmotivated. Um, I tell my students in my lab, there's always going to be a bigot in the room and your job is to be louder, right? Like, so it's important that the persons who do value this speak up. But also we do know from work in social psychology that external norms are important, right? So that if people are in an environment where they recognize that this is the norm, this is what I'm supposed to ascribe to, they strive towards that. So even building that into how people are evaluated, Right. So what are the ways that um, in terms of like hiring and promotion that you are evaluating your employees on their ability to support all different types of employees, including those of marginalized identities? So I do think external norms are important in terms of your your question about, you know, employee resource groups um, where, you know, for example, men talk about how to be um, allies. I'll, I'll just say that there the evidence is mixed on that. Okay. So um, on the one hand, I 100% do support the fact that it is not the responsibility of marginalized persons to teach folks who want to act as allies um, how to be an ally, right? Um, even though we should center their voices, recognize that there are lots of resources out there that you can read and you can talk to on your own, um, or even just if you wanna learn more about the experiences of, of people who are part of a marginalized group, you know, Twitter is free, uh, so is Instagram. <laughs> like these are ways where you get a window into someone's life without putting a burden on, on that person. So I do, I recognize this is why those employee resource groups exist, but I also think it's really critical that there's someone who has a little bit of knowledge to guide that kind of experience, to kind of help um, individuals set a goal, right? Like what is the end goal, right? Because you don't just want people sitting around talking about, um, how it can be hard, the conversation can go left very quickly. So making sure that there are there's someone that helps them develop goals, that something that's measurable in terms of what do we want people to gain as a result of this, um, I think is really critical. So I think that there can be value in, in those employee resource groups, but I think that you need to make sure you approach it in a way where there's clear structure and there's a clear end goal to make sure that the persons who are participating recognize what they're supposed to, to kind of accomplish um, from being in that group. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Having you here today has been amazing. And you've also given us so many actionable tools that we can use in our roles individually and interpersonally and collectively um, to be better allies. So really appreciate you sharing your research with us today.